I know, it's fun. I get, I get all the toys, so it's good. All right. All right, well, now we'll get into uh, the message for the day. Thank you, Lasnix, for doing that and being gracious. Um, today we're going to continue uh, our series, although it is Advent, uh, we are in the book of Matthew, which is telling of the life of, of Christ and his teachings. And so we remember, as we, even as we come into Advent, we come into the Christmas season, uh, that the Jesus that we celebrate and remember uh, as a baby being uh, born uh, to Mary, uh, is, it didn't stop there. That Jesus continued to not only grow, but did to live his life and to teach uh, us his ways. And so we're going to continue on through the book of Matthew uh, through this season as we continue to reflect upon who Jesus is and what he taught us. And so that's where we'll be again this morning. So if you've been with us, uh, you know we started the book of Matthew uh, probably a couple months ago at this point, and we are now finding ourselves in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to be in verses 33 through 48. We'll be looking at sections today, three different sections of that. Uh, And as we do this, uh, we want to remember a couple things about Matthew. We've got to remember what we're here for, what the book of Matthew is trying to communicate to us as a whole. And uh, so far in the book of Matthew, what we've seen uh, is that Jesus brings the heavenly kingdom to earth. Jesus brings the heavenly kingdom to earth. When he, when he came, not only as a baby, but then as he grew and as he taught, he would tell us that indeed he is bringing the heavenly kingdom here to the earth that everything was about to change, that the way we lived and the way that we would see life would completely change as he does bring his kingdom. The king comes to bring his kingdom. And as he comes preaching the kingdom and saying, be part of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And we've seen that repeated throughout the book of Matthew. And that's been a theme that we've seen. The king is here and now we're living in his kingdom for those who will follow him. And where we find ourselves now is in the midst of one of the most famous sections of the book of Matthew that has become known as the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, the kingdom discourse, as Justin has, has mentioned, is, is another way that we could, we could uh, title it. But for most of us, we do know this as the Sermon on the Mount. But the point of the Sermon on the Mount is pretty simple, and that is, what does living in the heavenly kingdom look like? What does living in the heavenly kingdom look like? So it's one thing to talk about the heavenly kingdom is here, but then what should that change and what should that look like? How should our lives reflect the fact that we're part of a new kingdom? And that's what Jesus has been doing uh, here in the Sermon on, on the Mount in Matthew 5, and it will continue on. But a couple things that we've already seen during this sermon is Jesus starts by saying that citizens of God's kingdom are congratulated for being different than all other earthly kingdoms. We are to be congratulated. Blessed are those who fill in the blank. The the Beatitudes is what they become known as. And Jesus says, by following a new way, a new kingdom, by following the, the king above all, you will be congratulated. You will receive blessing and you will be congratulated for being in the new kingdom. And so he starts with that and gives us some ideas of what a heavenly kingdom-minded person, what their attitude might look like as they are being congratulated by God for those things. And then he moved on and uh, he has been now talking about several things that we would call commandments or he starts talking about the law. And he starts talking about the fact that he, Jesus, has come not to abolish the law, not to throw it away uh, and to start everything new, uh, and, and not just to enforce the law in the way that the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders of his day would be enforcing the law, but actually Jesus comes to what we've looked at is fulfill the law, to fulfill it in a way that he would be the one to ultimately show us what it really means to follow his law to what it really means to follow God with our whole hearts in this new kingdom. And Jesus then has has been breaking down some of the commandments and the laws that have been misunderstood or have been completely just looked at as these are the outward things that we need to do. The do's and don'ts, we need to do this, not do that. It has to be about our actions and what we do on the outside. And Jesus has brought us to the point now where he said, no, law-abiding citizens of God's kingdom pursue exceedingly righteous lives, both inward and out. He talks about this idea that we in the new kingdom need to have righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees. 
And what does that look like? Well, that looks like an obedient heart that obeys from the inside out, not just does outward acts of obedience, but truly loves others and truly does everything out of a love for God and a love for others. And Jesus says it's just as important that we look at what's going on on the inside and not just focus on the outward commandments. <clears throat> and if we do that, then yes, we can live Lives that are exceedingly righteous, that are exceeding over uh, the current understanding of righteousness. And so he's looked at several things at this point. He's looked at murder and lust and divorce. Uh, He's looked at some things that we say, this is the law, but this is how it's fulfilled, and this is how now we as kingdom citizens need to live. And he's going to continue to do that today in verses 33 through 48. And so, let's go ahead and get there. Uh, We're going to start by reading the first passage that we're going to look at today is Matthew 5. We're going to go verses 33 through 37. Matthew 5, 33 through 37. If you'd follow along with me. Again, you have heard that it was said of those, to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool. Or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So in this first passage today, uh, there's a triplet of commands that Jesus is going to talk about today as we go through this uh, passage. He starts by talking about exceeding integrity. What it means to have exceeding righteousness as we are people of integrity. That kingdom citizens will have exceeding integrity. And he starts by talking about these oaths uh, and these vows that people have made. And so we're going to look at today four things. For each one of these three that Jesus is going to talk about, we're going to look at the law that he's referring to. We're going to look at the loophole that the people of the day have tried to impose into the law for them to be able to be righteous in their eyes. And then we're going to look at the fulfillment, how Jesus really brings it to what it's really all about. And then we're going to look at the expectation, which is how then should we live. So we're going to look at those four things for each of these things. And for the first section here, we're going to look at exceeding integrity. The law that Jesus is referring to here is simple, and that is that you follow through, that you must follow through with the promises that you've made in God's name. Follow through with the promises that you have made in God's name. We see this in the Old Testament. We see it in Leviticus 19.12 is one place where we're told in the law that you shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. And then in Numbers 30 verse 2, we see this. If a man vows a vow to the Lord or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. So the law, which is a good thing, the the good law that was given in the Old Testament uh, was simply that if you're going to make a promise and you're going to swear on God's name, I I swear on God's name I will do this, or I am vowing to the Lord that I will do this. If you do that, you better follow through and actually do it. Otherwise, you are swearing falsely, and what Leviticus tells us is you are profaning the name of God. You are saying, yes, I've taken God's name and I'm saying that I'm going to do it in his name, but then I'm going, to back, I'm going to back out, I'm going to not do what I promised, and that is where the law would be broken. Now, the people in Jesus' day have found a loophole to this law. Uh, as you look at the context, you look at the historical context, and basically what Jesus ends up talking about, because he talks about all of the different ways uh, that are all the different things that you shouldn't swear on is what he ends up talking about, and we'll see why he does that. What had started happening is people of the day, the loophole had been found, that some promises can then be broken if they're not made in God's name. In other words, well, if I don't swear on God's name, and if I don't say I swear to God, but I say I swear to Jerusalem, or I I swear to the heavens, I swear to the earth, or I swear to on my head, then that gave you an opportunity. So if you, if you couldn't really fulfill your oath or your vow or your promise, then it wasn't that big of a deal. You didn't really break the law because you never actually swore on God's name. And that's what was happening in Jesus' time and the religious leaders were finding this loophole that if we, if we say that we're going to do something, we just have to not use God's name, use something else and that gives us the ability to go back on our promises. It gives us the ability to be dishonest. 
And that's what was happening, and Jesus is going to address that, and he says, no, this is not what it's about. It's kind of like what was happening is these, um, these religious leaders were saying things while they had their fingers crossed behind their back. Have you ever done that as a kid? Like, oh yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do this. And you all, oh, oh, fingers crossed. That's basically what they're doing. And Jesus says, that's not, you're missing the whole spirit of what the law is all about. And that this law is all about integrity. It's all about keeping your word. It's all about being honest and keeping your promises. And so Jesus then does move on and talks about the fulfillment. And the fulfillment is basically this. He says, it's not about making outward oaths. Don't be so focused on making these outward oaths, but it's really all about inward integrity. As we see him talk here, he goes in and he says, don't take an oath at all, is what he starts by saying. And this is interesting, because there are some people that will take this and say, okay, you should never ever take an oath. Uh, there's, a, there's a wedding that's going to be happening this, this uh, afternoon here. And, you know, some people would say, well, you're not really supposed to take a vow or an oath at your wedding because Jesus said not to. Or there are other people that say, if you're in the court of law, you shouldn't put your hand on the Bible and swear an oath before you would give your testimony. Uh, I think we're getting way too legalistic as we look at this. Jesus here is talking about how we interact with people on a day-to-day basis, how we would have integrity and honesty in our everyday conversation and in our everyday living. This is not a, uh, a prohibition for all oaths for all time. This is simply pointing us to the fact that if you're so focused on making these outward oaths and doing it in ways that are finding loopholes, you're not truly being honest. And the point that Jesus is making, and when he gets to at the end, and we'll talk about it, is it's not about what you say you're going to do based on what you're swearing on. It's simply about keeping your word and being an honest person of integrity. And that's the whole point of this passage. The scribes and the Pharisees, this wasn't them. They were not honest. They were dishonest. They didn't have integrity. They were hypocrites. And they were using God's law to be able to get away with things uh, that they shouldn't have been doing. And they were not people of integrity. And Jesus says that's not how we should be. So he goes and he says, don't take an oath at all. But then he points out the fact that any oath that you would take, any promise you make, whether you say it's in the name of God, or whether you say it's by heaven, by the earth, by Jerusalem, or by your head, All of them, in the end, are still oaths that you're making before God. It's not as if God turns his back and doesn't listen if we make a vow and a promise in anything. It's not like he says, oh, well, you didn't say in my name, so I'm just not going to listen to it. Every oath, every promise we would make, and what he's saying to the religious religious leaders is, you might not be saying, I swear in God's name, but if you're swearing by something that God is created or by something that God is the one that is the author of, then you're doing the same thing. And he's pointing out the fact that this is a bigger thing. The the law was not there to create a loophole, but the law was there to show that we need to be honest people of integrity. And that's the expectation. So the law, follow through with your promises, the loophole, well, some can be broken if they're not made in God's name is what they were saying. Jesus says, no, that's not the point. Don't make outward oaths because you don't want to put yourself in a position to break them. You just need to be, have integrity. And then the expectation then for us as a kingdom citizen, we need to live a straightforward and honest life of integrity. Here he says at the end of this passage, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more that comes from this is evil. In other words, you don't need to play the game. You don't need to cross your heart and hope to die when you say that you're going to do something. You simply do it because that's what you're called to do. You either say yes or you say no. You live in a straightforward, honest life. Not a life of hypocrisy. Not a life of manipulation where you're manipulating other people. Where you're saying one thing and doing another and trying to get away with it through loopholes. Jesus says no, just be a person where your word counts where what you say is honest and what you say is going to be what people will hear and know that you're telling the truth. Kingdom citizens will be living lives of honesty, complete honesty. It's not just about not telling a lie, but it's also about not manipulating people. It's, not also not, it's about not breaking our promises. Say yes or say no. Be honest and straightforward with people. That is the fulfillment and the expectation of this law. Whereas the the religious leaders have made it so that they can find a loophole, we need to make sure that we are living honest lives of integrity. That is what Jesus would have for kingdom citizens, for all of us today. So we need to make sure that that's how we're living. 
So we want to have exceeding integrity. That's verses 33 through 37. But then Jesus moves on and talks about having exceeding mercy. Exceeding mercy is where he goes next. Uh, And we'll see where that comes from as we look at verses 38 through 42. No doubt you've heard this passage before. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. As Jesus looks at this, he is indeed talking about the fact that we need to have mercy on people in our lives. In our personal interactions, we need to live a life of mercy. So the law, the law that Jesus is talking about as he talks about an eye for an eye is found in the Old Testament. A couple places, Exodus 21, 23 through 25. But if there is harm, then you should pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Leviticus 24, 19 through 20. If anyone injures his neighbor, as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. Now, many times we hear this passage, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth and all of those things, and we, we think, man, that's kind of harsh. But actually, as you look at the Old Testament, there was a reason that God gave Israel this law about eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And it wasn't about trying to find revenge, but actually it was all about equal and fair justice. It was about equal and fair justice. That's what God was about as he brought the law to his people. And what these laws were put in place for was actually to restrain people from giving undue punishment. So you stole my ox, I'm going to kill you. That's not how it should work. You stole my ox, you have to pay me for my ox. Uh, So it's all about making sure that justice is equal and fair. That's the whole point of this law. However, the loophole comes when the religious people of the day and others in, in, uh, in Jewish times and honestly even now take this and they say, okay, great, this is the law telling me that I'm allowed to take revenge. Well, an eye for an eye, so therefore I need to go and I need to exact my revenge. That's what people start doing. It's used as an opportunity to excuse revengeful uh, attitudes. Well, you hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you because the Bible tells me to. Uh, And that is not the point of the law. The law was never there to say, okay, this gives you the right to hurt people. The law was there to restrain people from being unmerciful and from, to restrain people from cruel and unusual punishment, if that's how you want to say it. This was, uh, this was the law's way of, of giving the right to no cruel and unusual punishment. You would receive what you took. You would receive the punishment that was due the crime that you committed. But yet people took this and the loophole was it's good to seek revenge. They, they started to think, well, good, I'm going to find ways to, fi- to seek revenge on the people around me. And Jesus says, no, no, this is not what the law is about. He brings the fulfillment, and the fulfillment is this. It's not about personal revenge or justice. Uh, It's about mercy. Jesus says it's not about finding personal revenge or personal justice in your life, that your life needs to be characterized by trying to figure out how you can get back at the people who got at you. That is not how we should live as kingdom citizens, as heavenly kingdom citizens. That's not the way we are called to live. Uh, He says this specifically in this passage as we look at this. He says, you've heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, this is the authority that Jesus has. He says, do not resist the one who is evil. Now, the word resist here has been talked about many times, and there are some people who are pacifists that would say there should never be any war, there should never be anything that would be resistance. But really, the word resist here is talking about a courtroom. It's talking about taking someone to court to sue them. It's really talking about the legal right that you would have if someone were to injure you or hurt you. You could take them to court and you could say, you owe me. And you could do that. You you have the ability to do that according to the Old Testament law. But Jesus says there's a different way that that in this new kingdom we should live. And he starts by talking about the turn the other cheek passage. Many of you have heard this before. Uh, It says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, 
Turn to him the other also. This is not Jesus saying that we should voluntarily be abused. This is not Jesus saying that we should run into situations that will make it so that we'll get hurt. This is Jesus talking about how do we respond to people when they insult us and try to hurt us and they're trying to get under our skin. What should we do? And here's the thing. When we're talking about if someone slaps your right cheek, I don't have anybody up here to, to, to show this. I thought about bringing somebody up, but I won't do that. Uh, if you're going to slap somebody on their right cheek, okay, so right here, and you're staring at me, and you're right-handed, because most people are right-handed, only weirdos are left-handed, so if you're, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. No, I love left-handed people. Uh, so, uh, but in most cases, right-handed person, if they're going to slap you, they would slap you on the left cheek, because that's kind of natural. So in order to get to your right cheek, you either have to wrap your arm around their head to slap them, which doesn't make sense, or you give them a backhand, right? So this is really, Jesus is saying, if you get backhanded, and this is the greatest form of insult that you could give somebody, especially during this time. Like if you were to backhand somebody on the cheek, that was basically saying, I'm done with you, you're, you're scum, basically. It was the worst insult you could possibly hurl at somebody. Uh, and I guess you could probably say it would be somewhat similar to what people would say when they're flipping people the bird or that kind of thing. It's that kind of insult. That's what it is. It's a backhand, and it's an insult. And so what Jesus is saying is turn the other cheek. He's basically saying don't respond in kind. Don't slap them back. But if they're going to insult you, if they're going to be insulting, you be a person of mercy. And turning the other cheek is not looking for more abuse. It's simply saying I'm not going to retaliate against this insult. It's interesting, I was just on Friday at the uh, National uh, Baseball Hall of Fame with my family, and uh, they had a whole exhibit on Jackie Robinson when he came into the league, the first African-American player in the, in the uh, major leagues. And he came in, and uh, the guy who signed him, I don't remember his name, but the, the owner of the Dodgers at the time, he called him into his office, and he actually slapped Jackie Robinson, backhanded him right on the cheek. And uh, it took Jackie Robinson back a little bit, but he smacked him, and... Uh, and uh, it wasn't hard, but he, he said, I did that to remind you that what you're going to have to do in the position that you're going to find yourself in is you're always going to have to be in a position to turn the other cheek. And Jackie Robinson understood, the, understood that. He had a, a belief in the Bible, and he did that. No matter how many insults were hurled, hurled at him throughout all the years that he was playing in the uh, major leagues, he never retaliated, he was kind, and he never gave insult for insult. And that's kind of how we should be called. That's what we should be doing as kingdom citizens. Not let insults create an opportunity for us. By the way, if you look at how the law would have worked, if somebody were to do this to you, you would again have the right to take them to court uh, and, and deal with this. But again, Jesus says, don't resist. Don't, don't take the time to resist this. Just in, this insult, you just take it. And it's, again, not a, a license to be abused, but a license to show mercy. Then he talks about this tunic and cloak. He says, if someone is going to take your tunic, let them have your cloak also. Now, we don't quite understand this. Uh, uh, we don't walk around people taking our tunic versus our cloak. Tunic is kind of the, the lighter clothing that you wear underneath, and uh, it's not as important to keep you warm, but uh, your, uh, your cloak was something you'd wear to keep yourself warm. You'd sleep on it. You'd use it in so many different ways. And as you look in the Old Testament, actually, this was used a couple of times where uh, this was kind of a financial pledge. Like if you were to give somebody your cloak, you were basically signing a contract with them. And what Jesus, again, is saying is if people are going to try to swindle you out of stuff, you don't need to fight for what is yours, but just give it up. Show mercy and give it up. And this is completely countercultural. This is completely just so hard for us to even understand. But it's the understanding that, yes, you have a right to your clothes. You have a right to your cloak. That the, the law even says that you can, they have to give you your cloak by the end of the day so you have it for nighttime to sleep with. But if they take your tunic and they're going to sue you for that, if they're going to take what's yours, be willing to give whatever you need to give even give up your, your own stuff that, you, that belongs to you, your own rights, to show how much you love and have mercy on others. And then finally, the one mile, two miles here. It says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Uh, this was referring to what the Romans would do to the Jewish people. 
Romans, and we know this happened, even remember the man who had to carry Jesus' cross, but this would happen all the time. This was something that if Romans had a heavy thing that they were carrying and they didn't want to carry it anymore, they would find a Jewish person, they'd give it to them, and they'd say, you need to walk, you need to carry this for a thousand paces. And that's what they would have to do. It was one of the most demoralizing, one of the most insulting, one of the most embarrassing things that a Jewish person would have to do. And Jesus is bringing this up and he's saying, if somebody does that, if somebody makes you take a thousand paces, you just keep going and go on to a two thousand paces. You take it two miles. Again, Jesus' point is, yes, they're going to abuse you. Yes, they're going to make it so they're going to insult you. They're going to make it so that you're embarrassed, but it's all worth it if you will show mercy and love because that is how we live in the new kingdom. In the old kingdom, you fight back. In the old kingdom, you fight for yourself. You, you, you make sure that you get back at those who got to you. But that is not how we live in the new kingdom. Jesus is very clear through all of these different examples, turning the other cheek, giving up your cloak, and walking two miles instead of one, that our heart and our attitude needs to be one of mercy and love before we look for our personal justice and revenge. Because we're not called to revenge. Yes, we are called to fight for justice for others, but let's not get so obsessed with trying to find justice for ourselves that we forget to have mercy and love on those who are insulting us. So, the expectation, after I've said all that, is this. Give up what is yours and show mercy to others. And Jesus ends by talking about giving to the one who begs and not refusing the one who would borrow. The idea here is, Jesus says, be willing to give up what is yours for the good of others. Be willing to give up what is yours to show mercy for the good of others. This is not how the world works, but it is how the new kingdom works. So Jesus says we need to have exceeding integrity. He says we need to have exceeding mercy. And finally, he says we need to have exceeding love. Exceeding love. Verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes the sun, his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? For not even the tax, or do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus ends this section by talking about an exceeding love that we should have. And he starts by talking about the the law. The law that was given that all of the people who are listening would know. And we can see it clearly in the Old Testament in Leviticus 19, 17 through 18. It says, You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So that's the Old Testament understanding that we need to love our neighbors and not hate our brothers. That's what the Bible says, but apparently at some point along the way, there was a loophole added to this law. And the loophole was if the law is love your neighbors, then that means the opposite must also be true. If we are called to love our neighbors, then of course that must mean we're called to hate our enemies. That's what has happened. We read it here. Jesus says, you have heard, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So this was simply Jewish, people, Jewish lawmakers and, and religious people saying, okay, I'm just going to take, Jesus, God said love our neighbor, so that must mean we're okay. it's okay for us to hate our enemy. It's just like the other loopholes that they find. They're finding a way that they don't have to truly obey the real law the way it was meant to be followed. And so Jesus says, wait a minute, hold on. The fulfillment of love your neighbor, the, the, the law that he would later on in the book of Matthew say, loving God and loving your neighbor is the whole of the law. And he says, loving your neighbor is not about excluding people. Loving your neighbor is not about excluding people, but about loving everyone. The point here is that love is to be uh, unmerited, that love is to be given to both the people we love and the people we don't love, because that is how new the new kingdom works. That's how kingdom citizens live. We love not only those who love us, but we love even our enemies. 
And this is a natural progression from what he just got done talking about with all the insults that might be hurled at us. Remember at the beginning, by the way, of of the Beatitudes, and he'll talk about this even more as we go on, that uh, Jesus says you're going to be persecuted, people are going to treat you unfairly, people are going to treat you poorly. He's talking about those people now. He's saying those enemies, those people that are going to treat you poorly, you don't have the right to hate them. Again, totally different than all the kingdoms, all the earthly kingdoms we would have. This is different as we look at the heavenly kingdom. And so Jesus says, no, hating your enemies is not something that is okay simply because you can love your neighbors and hate your enemies. He says it's not about excluding people, it's about loving everyone. This comes very clear in this passage that we read. Uh, He says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, uh, that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. And if you see the title of our sermon this morning, it's like Father Like Sons, and this is where we're going to get this from. And basically what Jesus says, you need to be like the Father. And later on he'll say, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be like God. And then he goes on and says, well, what does God do? What does God do? Well, we see that he doesn't exclude people from his common grace or his common love. He says here that the sun comes on the the evil and the good and rain comes on the just and the unjust. See, God doesn't say, well, if you love me, I'm going to bless you. If you don't love me, I'm going, to re- I'm going to withhold everything from you. No, God still gives good things to even bad people because of his, what we would call his common grace, that he shows goodness to all people even though nobody deserves it. And the just and the unjust receive that same love. Now, obviously, we know John 3.16, for God so loved the world. God has a love for all people, but not all people will respond to his love in a way that would mean that he, they would be kingdom citizens. But he does make the point here that he cares for people, whether they're good or bad, and we should follow that example. But this is not how we normally live. We normally treat those who treat us well, well, and treat those who don't treat us well, unwell. That's probably not the right word. But we don't, this is, that's, na- that's natural to us as people of an earthly kingdom. But a citizen of heaven is called to be different. And so that leaves then the expectation, love all people as God does. Love all people as God does. This is not easy. Honestly, it feels like it's not even possible. But I believe that through God's help, through his spirit, we too can love others, not only those who love us, but also our enemies. And here we're told at the end, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. This is a hard passage to read because we know that we can't be perfect because we aren't God we are human and we can't be perfect and and morally uh, perfect in everything we do but let's keep this in context the context of this is showing us that when we're talking about this perfect it's the perfect love of God it's a it's a love that does not show partiality and this is seen even throughout the New Testament the book of James we've looked at that in the past But we don't show partiality. We love others, whether our enemies or whether our friends. We love all people and show them care and concern and put ourselves behind them. That is the point of love. It's putting others first. And as hard as it is to do for our enemies, actually, as hard as it is to do for those who we like, it's even harder to do for people who are our enemies. And yet, we are told that our goal is to look at God and to say, His perfect love is something I am striving for. And no, we may never totally achieve that, but we can move towards it. And that's the point here. Jesus wants us to move towards a love that is impartial, a love that is unconditional. And as I said, this is not easy. It's one of the hardest things. Seems impossible. The New Testament talks about this a whole lot more. So I want to look at some other verses if you'll follow along with me this morning. So we're looking at this idea that the expectation of kingdom citizens is that we would love all people as God does. 1 Peter is where we're going to start. 1 Peter 1, verses 15 through 16. We're going to jump to verse 22 and then finish with chapter 2, verse 1. It'll all be on the screen. But we're in 1 Peter chapter 1. But as he who called you is holy, be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Sounds very similar to what we just read with you must be perfect as your father is perfect. But then he goes on and and says some more. In verse 22 we get this. Having purified your souls by the obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love for one another earnestly from a pure heart. Then in verse 1 of chapter 2. So put away all malice and all deceit. 
and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Even this word deceit reminds us back to what we talked about at the beginning of our time together. We need to have exceeding integrity. But here the point is, in 1 Peter, it says, be holy as I am holy, and then he goes into what that looks like. And it's love from a pure heart. It's love from a pure heart. Enduring love from a pure heart. That is what being holy like God is holy, being set apart, because that's the point of holiness. Remember, it's to be completely different. It's to be set apart. And as we're new in the new kingdom that is completely different and completely set apart from the old earthly kingdoms, we then, as kingdom citizens, are also called to be holy and different. And one of the best and biggest and most obvious ways to be different is to love in a way that is unconditional and impartial. As we continue on uh, with First Peter, I'm going to jump over to First Peter chapter two, because remember that as we love all people, there is a there is an example, there is uh, something to look at when we're called to love all other people. We're called to look at God's love, and God's love is seen in Jesus. And what we see is what Jesus did through love in First Peter two nineteen through twenty four is our example. First Peter two nineteen through twenty four, for this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. Now listen to what Jesus did. And then think about all that we've been talking about here in the Sermon on the Mount. There's so many parallels here. He committed no sin... Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Listen to what Jesus did for us. There was no deceit. There was no sin. He was a man of exceeding integrity. He was a man of exceeding mercy. By his wounds, we have been healed. And he did not revile in return. He could have reviled in return. He could have judged them right there in return. But no, he took the reviling and he suffered for us. That's what Jesus did. That's the example that we follow. And then he shows exceeding love in the fact that he bore our sins, even though we are his enemies. Which gets us to the next passage I want to read, Romans 5, 9 through 11. Romans 5, 9 through 11. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies, notice that, for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled we shall be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Talking about the example of Jesus that we looked at in 1 Peter chapter 2, the fact that he had no deceit, no revenge, and he loved us enough to heal us from our wounds, to suffer for us. And then Romans 5, 9 says when he did that, when he didn't just do it for people he liked or loved, but he did it for his enemies. Jesus died for us while we were still enemies. If he can die for an enemy, then I can love an enemy. If he can die for an enemy, then I can, I can give up uh, my, my cloak even to an enemy. I can give my other cheek to an enemy. I can do all of those things. I can uh, walk two miles instead of one. I can do these things because Jesus loved his enemies so much to die for us so that we could be saved from wrath. The wrath that we deserved, the justice that we deserved was actually placed upon Jesus on the cross. The judgment that we deserved was placed upon Jesus. The wrath of God was placed upon Jesus as he lived that perfect life that he was called to live, but then he died on the cross for our sins to forgive us of our sin, to shed his blood so that we could be justified, so that God would look at us and say, yes, that he, he, she is righteous. And Jesus did that by dying for us as his enemies, by giving his blood, by giving his life, even when we're enemies. 
And yes, the story continues where Jesus rises again and proves his power over sin and death and is now waiting for us, for those who will follow him in faith and believe in who he is, believe in what he's done, and trust him with our lives and become kingdom citizens. We, are, we can follow the king forever and have eternal life with him. That's what Jesus did. That's Jesus' love. So Jesus didn't just preach this. You know, we hear the, the words all the time, practice what you preach. Well, Jesus did. Jesus is preaching this in the Sermon on the Mount. But later, everyone will watch him not only preach and teach this, but live it. He would live it through his death for us. And so then we're told that we need to be his sons. Like father, like sons, we need to follow him as his children to love people the best we can through his strength. That's what we're called to. And if you don't believe me, then let's look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 21. This is what Paul reminds us that as Christians in the new kingdom, we are called to. It says this in Romans 12. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Kingdom citizens don't return evil for evil. They return evil with good. They don't look for their own vengeance. They let God deal with it. Instead, we look out for even our enemy. We love even our enemy. And in the end, we live peaceably with all people. If we are truly to be kingdom citizens, we should live in love and peace. Now, keep in mind, when I say love, that doesn't mean acceptance of everything. Love sometimes is saying hard things that may even hurt people. Sometimes love is being truthful. So I'm not saying we need to tolerate everything and just sweep everything under the rug. I'm saying we need to have true love. If we care about those around us, our enemies and those who, we lo- who love us, we will love them completely. You know, Jesus loved us enough to teach us what it looks like to live for him. And we should do the same, teach others. So, will we respond by loving our enemies and doing good as Jesus does? Brings us to our conclusion. Have you four questions to ask ourselves as we leave today? Number one, have you received the honest mercy and love of Jesus? What I just talked about, everything that Jesus did, that he lived a perfect life, became a human for us. Going to celebrate that here in just a few weeks. Lived a perfect life, died a death on the cross that we deserve to die took the wrath of God for us for our forgiveness, rose again to prove that sin and death had no power over him and therefore, if we follow him, it has no power over us. And then he asks us simply to follow, to trust him and follow him, believe in who he is, believe in what he's done and follow him. That's what he calls us to do. Every single one of us has that ability and that, that, that opportunity and if you haven't taken that opportunity, you need to do that today. Follow the king, become a new kingdom citizen. Don't live in the old ways any longer. Three more questions we need to ask. Are you living an honest life of integrity like Jesus did? Are you living an honest life of integrity like Jesus did? Jesus never lied. He never manipulated. Jesus told the truth. He is the truth, according to John 14, 6. And so we should live lives of truth and integrity. And I actually made a mistake here when I say, are you living an honest life of integrity like Jesus did? I actually should say, does. Does. Jesus still lives, and he still lives a life of integrity. Same is true in the next question. Are you living a life of mercy as Jesus did? Are you living a life of mercy as Jesus does? God shows us mercy, even though we deserve judgment and wrath. We can extend the same to those around us, even our enemies. And finally, are you living a life of unconditional love as Jesus did? Are you living a life of unconditional love as Jesus does? Again, his love is impartial. He loves those who come 
and simply say, Jesus, I need you. And he shows his love to us even though we are, were, were his enemies. Now we're his friends. We are reconciled. That's what Jesus did. And so we should be people of love and reconciliation as well. That's what it looks like to live like our father, to live like the king in the new kingdom. We're gonna have an opportunity now to sing one more song together as the worship team comes up. And as we sing, I just want us to consider what it looks like in our lives to truly be new kingdom citizens, to follow Jesus in the way he loved, to follow Jesus in the way he still loves.